didn't work. At Raytheon Intelligence in Space, we're focused on designing and delivering the disruptive technologies our customers need to succeed in any domain. Space, air, ground, land, undersea, and maybe with uh, most importantly for this next event is cyberspace. We're proud to partner with our nation and our allies to craft solutions to win in that critical cyber domain. And I'm very eager to listen to this next session on just that topic, the intersection of cybersecurity and national security. Neither of our panelists need much of an introduction, but please allow me to share a little bit of background. General Nakasone serves as commander of US Cyber Command, director of the National Security Agency, and chief of Central Security Service. He previously commanded U.S. Army Cyber Command and the Cyber National Mission Force at U.S. Cyber Command. His most recent overseas posting was at the, as the Director of Intelligence, J2, International Security Assistant Force Joint Command in Kabul. He also served twice as Staff Officer on the Joint Chief of Staff. Thank you for your leadership, General Nakasone. And thank you for being here today to discuss the partnership between Cyber Command and NSA in defending our nation. I'd also like to introduce our moderator for this panel, David Ignatius, a fellow Massachusetts native. David is an award-winning columnist for the Washington Post and has worked as executive editor of the International Herald Tribune, assistant managing editor for business news at the Washington Post, and a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He's also the author of 10 novels, one of which was made into a movie. Thank you, David. The floor is yours. So, General, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. You're from an agency that used to be known as No Such Agency. And it's good to see you uh, out uh, and doing this kind of public event. Thanks, thanks for doing thanks, it. Thanks, David. So uh, Russia has been a, a big concern of yours and your job uh, from the beginning. And we have some interesting and different news about Russia in the last few days. The New York Times reports this morning that uh, CIA Director Burns is in Moscow, that he's talking with the Russians uh, about possible new areas of discussion and cooperation. Uh, we have strategic stability talks that are going on between the U.S. and Russia. I wrote the other week about a surprising development, a joint uh, cybersecurity resolution at the United Nations that was submitted by the U.S. and Russia. I want to ask you uh, whether from your standpoint uh, as NSA director and cybercom commander, you're seeing any uh, evidence of a different uh, environment and, and specifically in the area where President Biden has talked with President Putin uh, and asked him to help, namely uh, ransomware attacks by groups operating from Russia, whether you're seeing anything different from your perspective. So David, first of all, um, thanks and thanks to Aspen. It, it is truly nice to be back in the company of people. Um, you know, for, yeah, I agree. <laughs> As we think about having a conference and actually being able to do it face to face, it is so refreshing. Uh, before I get to your first question, let me just talk a little bit. And I was thinking about this as I was coming down today. What's changed in really the almost, you know, three and a half years that I've been in, in charge of both uh, NSA and Cyber Command? Um, so first of all, I think if you're going to talk about our agency at NSA, one of the things that's significantly different is the fact that it is a much more upfront, transparent. Uh, engaging with the public, uh, focused on cybersecurity agency than, than ever before. On the cybercom side, I would say is what I've seen over the past three and a half years is a growing capacity and capability uh, in a number of different actions and a number of different capabilities that we've been able to bring in support of the defense of the nation. I'm very, very proud of that. But what hasn't changed uh, over the past three and a half years? I think the first thing is, one, the importance of people. Um, our number one strength at our agency and our command is our talent, uh, no doubt about it. And the second thing, David, to get to your question is, there are still adversaries that are operating. They're operating every single day in this space. You know, Chairman Newley just talked about um, you know, strategic competition, and this was with a number of different adversaries. Strategic competition is alive and well in cyberspace. 
And we're doing it every single day with persistent engagement. And I think the last point in terms of, while I'll leave the policy pieces to you know, our policy folks, uh, certainly uh, we are uh, obviously very, very vigilant. Uh, we are very, very um, uh, prepared, well-trained, and, and I think uh, very anticipatory of uh, obviously the work that's being done on the political and the diplomatic front to, uh, to get to a better resolution here. Just to press on this question of, of ransomware attacks, I asked uh, your government uh, colleague, Jen Easterly, who's the uh, head of CISA at the Department of Homeland Security uh, a month or so ago, if she'd seen or was aware of any Russian action in response to President Biden's request for help in dealing with these ransomware attacks, and she said flatly, no, I haven't. Uh, would you say the same thing? So I think it's too early to tell. Uh, that's what I would say. And, and uh, my good friend Jen is, uh, I think, answering for a moment in time. And uh, what I would say is, uh, let's let this play out, right? I mean, there's engagement going on, again, uh, in a realm that's that out, it's outside of what I do. But I would say that um, it's too early to tell. So uh, to ask one more uh, detailed question in the news, and I literally mean in the news. It just posted about uh, a half hour ago. Uh, my colleagues at the Washington Post Ellen Nakashima, who covers your uh, agency uh, very carefully and well, and Dalton Bennett just posted a story saying that Cyber Command last month conducted an operation uh, against the ransomware group RE Evil, uh, in which you were able to divert traffic that was heading to their servers. They went, whoa, what's happening? Looked at their servers and realized that, not simply because of uh, Cyber Command operations, but others, that they had been compromised and shut down their uh, operations, according to this story. Uh, the story says that Cyber Command wouldn't comment, and I don't think I'm, I'm likely to get you to go beyond that, but. So you're gonna ask the commander of Cyber but, Command. <laughs> uh, but I, but I wanna ask in general, um, we're in a world where it is useful for the world, our adversaries, and our friends too, to understand the capabilities that we have. So without asking about this specific case, uh, talk a little bit about what you're able to do in this forward deployed mode that you've talked about uh, in dealing with uh, groups like this that are uh, creating such mischief, havoc uh, in, the, in the private sector. Yeah, you know, if you would have asked me this question a year ago, I probably would have said something along the lines of ransomware, ransomware, that's uh, criminal actions, that's handled by someone else. Uh, but what have we seen over the past year? We have seen adversaries use implants, adversaries use zero day vulnerabilities, you know, vulnerabilities that companies never ever see and are able to gain access. And then we've seen ransomware uh, most vividly in the attack on our, our pipeline on the East Coast. Um, so one of the things that we have done at both the agency and the command is we've conducted a surge. And when you say, hey, well, so, so what is that about? It's like we bring our best people together, David. I mean, the really good thinkers of how do you get after folks that are doing this? How do you get after you know, the capabilities that they're, that they're uh, producing? How do you get after the, the flow of money? Um, those are all things that, that we have done over the past uh, really three months. Uh, and while I won't comment on specific operations, I, I would say that um, you know, we've made a lot of progress. And uh, I'm pleased with the progress that we've made, and we've got a lot more to do. But this is broader than just NSA and Cyber Command. This is you know, working with Jen Easterly and her great folks at CISA. This is working with you know, Chris Ray and the FBI. And specifically, it's working with the private sector. And that's why you know, this is an important piece of, and I hope we get to this, the public-private uh, mix that, that we have uh, you know, really realized we've got to do even more than we've done in the past. So I, I want to ask you about one uh, interesting feature of your job, which is that you wear two hats. You had uh, a nominally civilian agency, the National Security Agency, and you had uh, Cyber Command, the, the military uh, 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 command center for our operations. When I've visited Fort Meade as a journalist, um, I've been struck by the, this uh, anomalous workforce. You walk down the halls and you see people in uniform who are <laughs> sure are military people, and then you see people in black t-shirts and sometimes ponytails and ear piercings, and you know, th those are part of your NSA workforce. And I want to ask you about uh, managing a workforce like that, and then 
ask you to comment on the question that people have raised for a decade, which is whether it really makes sense long term to have those two quite different under the same hat. So uh, first of all, I, I think you would say that you know coming to our agency in command is, is a reflection of our nation, right? I mean, we have uh, a great demographic there. Uh, you do hit on a point that you know we have people that look like me, dress like me, um, have haircuts like me, and we have folks that don't look like me and have haircuts like me, and that's perfectly fine. But what's the commonality that really kind of binds these folks together? Well, as one of my seniors at NSA once told me, he said, you know, I worked in the private sector for 40 years, and I was just shocked when I first got to NSA, and the first thing that they did is he asked me to swear an oath to the Constitution. So that's the commonality that we all have. We all swear the oath to the Constitution. Protect and defend. The second piece is, is that these are folks by nature that like, to, that like to get after really hard problems. And we've got lots of hard problems. And guess what? We've got incredible technology and incredible talent uh, and we're all resourced and being able to, to solve these really difficult challenges like ransomware and, and election security and what our adversaries are doing in cyberspace. These are folks that want to do that. And that's the whole focus of what they want to do no matter what they wear or what they look like. Um, you asked me about the dual hat. Um, I've had three and a half years uh, leading both organizations. And I think I would just come back and say a couple things. First of all, at the end of the day, this is, this is a decision that, that I don't make. It's a decision that are made by our policymakers. Um, but here's what I would share with you, having led the organizations for three and a half years. Um, what are we seeing in cyberspace today? We're seeing our adversaries operating at a scope, scale, and sophistication that's different. We're seeing adversaries that can morph quickly to do things like ransomware and zero-day attacks and, and use bots very, very uh, ingeniously to, to get after uh, end states. Uh, and we're seeing the focus of not only nation states, but proxies and, and other criminals that are operating in cyberspace. The one commonality that I think uh, is so important to have someone lead both organizations is that you have to operate in cyberspace with three things. Speed, agility, and unity of effort. What's my proof for that? My proof for that now is Successful election defenses in 2018 and 2020, the ability to get after ransomware, the ability to take on you know, unique challenges that the nation faces here. Um, I, I think that's done with those three things. And in my experience, again, is that uh, that's enabled by one person leading both organizations. One uh, criticism of that argument, that the dual hat uh, approach makes sense, came after the solar winds uh, hack, uh, devastating. Uh, in its way uh, by uh, identified as being conducted by the Russian intelligence service, uh, the SVR. Uh, a, a cyber uh, commentator wrote on the blog of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, the NSA's support to Cyber Command's operational requirements could have inadvertently contributed to the intelligence failure of not anticipating or uncovering the solar winds incident. And the argument, as I understand it, was you, quite understandably, are focused outward. You're focused on foreign threats. And our adversaries are now able to appear to be operating from inside the United States. And that's part of why solar winds was so hard to find and so devastating. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, General, as you reflect on that, whether there's any truth to that uh, concern, criticism, and how you deal with it. I mean, all, our adversaries may not look like they're out in foreign networks in the future, but if you're focused there, uh, that may limit our ability to respond. David, I, I think that that's a, a really good uh, commentary to, to talk about, again, the agility of our adversaries. Uh, we begin with the authorities of NSA and Cyber Command. They are outside the United States. For very good reasons, we don't operate within the boundaries of the United States. Um, the second piece, though, I would say is that um, this is why it's so important for the partnership between public and private to continue to evolve. Let's talk about solar winds. A couple days before Thanksgiving in 2020, Kevin Mandia, the CEO of Mandiant, came to NSA and said, hey, I think we have a problem here. We've talked about this publicly. We, you know, we, we've shared that at, at his conference, uh, just the incredible uh, foresight that he had to come to our agency. He came to our agency because he knew that 
we understood what goes out in foreign space. He understand the technical capabilities that we have and he knew that he had a problem. This is the type of public-private partnership that is so important. This is what I think you know, Jen is driving to, Jen Eshley is driving to, and Joint Cyber Defensive Collaborative, the JCDC initiative. I think that's what we all want to do collectively. But again, let's come back to solar winds. Um, you know, having run NSA for three and a half years, I would tell you the most damaging thing is to have a successful operation be uncovered. Now, while we didn't get left of the theft here with regards to solar winds, we were able to expose this, and that's really great credit to Kevin Mandy and the folks that had worked it so hard across it. So this is a vector that is not going to be able to use by our adversary, and I think this is an example of the partnership that's so important. So you've talked about public-private uh, partnerships. There uh, is a way in which uh, the NSA and even Cyber Command are now more uh, transparent to uh, companies in the U.S when you have uh, information about malware, about uh, dangerous vulnerabilities, you're finding ways to share it. If you could uh, talk about that and uh, tell us where you want to take that connection with uh, private business, private individuals in the U.S. The, uh, GCHQ, your British counterpart, now has a cybersecurity center that's extraordinarily uh, outward facing and reaching. Do you want to be in that a similar position? So uh, I think to answer that is just to kind of understand where we were and where we've been over the past couple years. In 2019, we re-stood up a cybersecurity directorate. That's one of our two missions at NSA. And when I got there, that was one of the areas that I said, hey, we need to, to, to change this because we need to be able to have one person in charge, focused, resourced, being able to do that. In 2010 was really our first big decision when we said, hey, we're going to publicly take credit for a significant vulnerability in the Windows 10 software. So you'd say, well, how hard a decision was that? Well, it wasn't that hard a decision, but I would tell you that's not necessarily the culture and the ethos that our agency had, had operated under for a number of years. And so, you know, I think that's a, a big change for us in, in saying that there's a vulnerability. We substantiate the vulnerability, and I think that's important because when people look to the National Security Agency, I think there's a stamp, an imprimatur that says, hey, these guys are really good at what they're doing. And so when they release a product with CISA or FBI saying, hey, here are the 25 top vulnerabilities that the Chinese are using, people take notice. Uh, if you're a system administrator out there and you're trying to figure out what do you need to patch, you know, well, if NSA says this is the most vulnerable thing, we probably should do that. That's one aspect of it. But there are other aspects of the public-private partnership. Uh, at NSA, I, I'm thrilled about the, the work that is being done by a number of different partners with us, our Centers for Academic Excellence, the, the work with the National Cryptologic Foundation that has been established now for us to be able to go after talent and for a broader range of, of cybersecurity elements, an unclassified cybersecurity center that we've stood up outside the gates of NSA. And for Cyber Command, it's the same way, uh, you know, an ability for us to do uh, unclassified work in a, in a facility called Dreamport in Columbia, Maryland. Um, these are all examples of what's being done. Uh, where I'd like it to go, uh, so uh, we are uh, very, very focused on national security systems. Uh, that's where we're, you know, authorized to look. We're also very, very uh, uh, dependent upon the defense industrial base. That's where we want to go. And, and most importantly, uh, I want to be the premier partner for folks like Chris Ray and Jen Eshley and, and the private sector when they need assistance. Let me ask you a, a maybe a unlikely question, but as we look at the cyber landscape, there is a huge difference from 10 years ago, certainly from uh, the four years of the Trump administration, in that there is an absolutely um, emphatic stress on this issue, and there are lots of new people in prominent positions. I, I think of Ann Neuberger, who used to be your colleague uh, at NSA, who's now uh, in the White House at the National Security Council, big portfolio on cybersecurity. Uh, Chris Inglis, uh, another former colleague of yours, is the National Cyber Director. Jen Easterly uh, heads uh, CISA, which is, uh, has a oversight of a lot of these activities. Then you've got individual, individual activities by the FBI, other agencies. If a management consultant looked at that organization chart, uh, he or she would worry that there are too many boxes there uh, and that the lines are um, hard to follow. And I, I just want to ask whether we need to 
think more about how to coordinate that so that we don't have, we don't end up with what we've seen in national security can be stovepipes. I think, David, you know, I begin with, uh, you highlight, I think, some great choices. Uh, obviously, Ann and Chris and, uh, and Jen are folks that we know well at our agency. They've contributed tremendously at our agency in, in positions there. Uh, and they're the right folks to, to lead these organizations. But I think to your question, I mean, we organize um, within our government based upon our ideals, uh, you know, what we believe in, what the Constitution says. And so when you take a look at that, you have a number of different players. I think it does make sense, right? I mean, it makes sense to, you know, one organization that is looking outside the United States, like the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, another organization that's focused within the United States, that comports with, with how, you know, we believe government should be run. Um, but I think to your point is our challenge as leaders is so how do you stitch that together? What makes that look effective? Uh, and I think you could begin with election security and say, hey, here's an exemplar. Here's something where you've, you know, gone across a number of different agencies and in the past couple of elections you seem to have had some success. And so I think that that's, you know, a really good starting point as we take a look at how does this, you know, broadly get to our ability to defend the nation in cyberspace. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, your uh, mission in countering foreign attempts to in interfere with our elections. That's been a very visible uh, NSA Cyber Command responsibility. Um, we were all focused on it uh, after the 2016 election. Uh, you were uh, quite uh, open uh, in talking about the uh, uh, Russia small group, as you called it, uh, at NSA and Cyber Command that was working in the 2018 midterm elections that obviously continued in the 2020 elections. Give us um, an update on those activities and if you would, uh, give us lessons learned. You've been now through three election cycles. You've learned a lot about our vulnerabilities, uh, what to do to defend ourselves, what the future threats are gonna be in this space of guarding the, the security of our elections. So to understand, I think the future, you have to go back to 18, where I think is really the seminal event where we said, okay, uh, we're gonna come together as both a command and the agency, but it's more broadly than that. It was a command and agency, it was CIS, it was FBI. How do we work together? One threat primarily there. Uh, we worked it very, very hard. Uh, we had success there. And I think out of 18, we learned a couple things. We learned the fact that um, we have to have a broader set of partners. We came out of the election in 18 saying, uh, this is not gonna be just one adversary in the future. And so we've gotta be able to scale. And the third thing I think we said is, hey, there are other partners here that we haven't had an opportunity to bring into the fold. So 20, what's the difference in 20? More actors in terms of adversaries trying to influence our election, a broader set of partnerships, uh, so, you know, the ability to, to work with the National Guard, the ability to work with academia, the ability to work with select international partners, and the ability to work with the private sector that I think uh, that CISA and FBI did so well in, in 2020. What does it mean for the future? Uh, the future, I think, is really uh, composed of really three things that we're going to have to do. Uh, so, first of all, internally to our command and our agency, we have to generate insights. So, we have to go into elections knowing the adversaries better than they know themselves. The second thing is we have to figure out how to share information. Share information rapidly. I mean, the, the, the thing that we learned in 18 is that we could, we could really help the Bureau uh, if we could provide information to them that they could pass on rapidly to, to social media companies, which they did so effectively. And the last thing is, is that, hey, we, we've got to be able to somehow impact adversaries that don't get the message. We're going to have to impose cost on them. And so that's, that's a little bit of the, 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 the election landscape, not only now, but I think into the future. In terms of the imposed costs part of that, what uh, has been reported in the news media is that in 2018, uh, and, and presumably subsequently, um, some of these malign actors, uh, Russia is at the top of the list in terms of election interference, uh, the people who were seeking to interfere in our elections um, uh, were confronted by uh, the cyber uh, presence of Cyber Command and its partners, through its partners. Uh, there have been published reports about how you were, your forward deployment has you working with 
services uh, in, in Eastern Europe who were familiar with Russian networks, uh, and that you were able to make them feel some pain. Is that a, is that a good way to put it? Um, so I, I guess what I would say, David, is that um, in 2018, uh, we were really um, putting the, the final touches on what we call persistent engagement. Uh, and persistent engagement is based upon the department's strategy of defend forward. That is, how do you operate outside the United States to do two things? One, enable partners, and two, to act. Uh, and so, you know, to give you an example, in not only 2018, but 2020, we sent over 10 hunt forward teams to different countries. And, and what is a hunt forward team? It's a, a group of really good uh, cyber soldiers and civilians that goes to a country at their behest to hunt on their networks. And what are we hunting for? We're hunting for malware, we're hunting for tradecraft, we're hunting for any kind of indication that our adversaries might be utilizing that we can then expose. Again, when you expose tools, when we share that information with the private sector, again, back to the point of public-private partnerships, it gives an inoculation for a lot of networks uh, against an adversary that thinks they have a tool. Um, we have conducted operations. I, I think that that's been you know, well-established and, and talked about by the, the government in 2018. And while I won't go into the further depths of that, I think the important thing to, to uh, emphasize here is that uh, we have a capability. Uh, we have obviously a process upon which we uh, utilize that capability, and we have really well-trained people. Uh I use the phrase, feel some pain. Um, is, that, is that an accurate description of, of, of what those capabilities can do? So I think you'd have to ask our, ask our adversaries if they felt some pain. <laughs> we'll have them for the next, uh, next Aspen Security Forum, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned persistent engagement. Um, and one of the early things you did when you became uh, uh, Cyber Command uh, commander and, and head of the NSA was to give a lengthy interview to uh, Joint Forces Quarterly, not on most of our um, you know, daily reading lists, but, but it was a detailed discussion of your doctrine. And you talked about persistent engagement, and my takeaway was that you were saying the United States now is in a constant low-level state of cyber conflict with its adversaries, that we should no longer think of conflict in this domain as an on-off switch. You know, you're either at war or you're not, but it's a rheostat, and that the rheostat is kind of permanently set at about two in this persistent engagement world. Uh, and I, I want to ask uh, whether, as you've gone down the road, um, you would expand on that idea of persistent engagement. and. Am I describing that kind of constant state of, of conflict, that you know, sliding rheostat at about to right? And I, I've worried personally, looking at the news, that it's that rheostat's going up to three or four. Uh, so I'm curious about that too. So I think I would change the word conflict to competition. I think we're in competition every day, and I think that's why the the chairman's talk about strategic competition in a number of different domains is so important. That's what we're in in cyberspace. You know, what are our adversaries trying to do? They're trying to steal our intellectual property. They're trying to interfere in our elections. They're trying to, uh, you know, have other marked impacts on our diplomatic or, or economic efforts. Um, this is the world in which we operate. And so when I was trying to explain in 2018 what persistent engagement was, I, I, again, I came back to two points. I said, we're going to enable our partners, and then we're going to act when authorized. And I think that was the difference in, in 2018, given the fact that, we had a new strategy that said, hey, we're going to operate outside the United States and we're going to uh, look for adversaries that might be trying to do us harm and we're not going to just watch anymore. And I think that, that that was a pretty big watershed event. So in the military realm, um, we like to think that deterrence operates, that we have such capabilities that our adversaries will be deterred from actions that would harm us. Uh, it's the whole premise, obviously, of our, of our nuclear deterrent. But there's, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about whether that model really applies to cyberspace. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, we have all these capabilities. You know, your command, the NSA, probably s still best in the world. So you'd think that we'd be able to deter. But as you look at the rising number of attacks, you wonder. 
does deterrence work in this domain? So I want to put that to you directly. Does the deterrence model work, or do we need to think about it in a slightly different way? So I, I grew up in the deterrence world that, that you described, right? It was a, a nuclear deterrence world where it really was a binary yes or no, that, uh, that we understood that one nation had these capabilities, when you use those capabilities, and the other nation said, okay, I understand that. Um, that's a different world than the, the world of cyberspace. I don't think that that's a model that, that comports. I do believe, as Secretary Austin has talked about, um, there is a model of deterrence that probably includes such, as, such things as integrating what we do with our partners, what we do in a multiple number of domains. So it's not just cyberspace that, that we're trying to influence our adversaries. It could be cyberspace and the ground, air, sea, and, and other ones that, uh, that we're trying to, to obviously get our uh, adversaries to, to change their behavior. I think thirdly is um, that there is a piece of you know, deterrence that, that uh, certainly works with regards to resilience and defense that's so important that we have to be able to do. Uh, but I think broadly to your question, I, I think that we're still a learning organization. How the deterrence model is going to play out and you know, how much of the competition space influences what adversaries are doing, uh, we're, still, we're still learning at this. And I think that there's a number of different efforts that are showing us that there are ways that we can improve it. What do you think of the effort, uh, the most uh, prominent uh, advocate uh, really is the president of, of Microsoft, Brad Smith, uh, for international rules of the road, a kind of Geneva Convention, he likes to say, for cybersecurity. That's something that the U.S. government has often been reluctant about because it might uh, limit our own ability to take actions, and, and we have such extraordinary capabilities. What, what do you think about uh, that idea to, to today uh, and, and how it would affect uh, the world you live in? So, so Brad and I have had this conversation on, in some forms um, outside of, uh, out of Aspen. And, and you know, one of the things that, uh, that I continue to say on this is that uh, obviously that's, that's a policy element that the policymakers work through and, and decide on it. What's my responsibility? My responsibility is to provide a series of options to the president and provide insights to the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence in terms of what's going on. So uh, again, I, I'll leave that policy piece, but you know, I think what I need to be able to do is to make sure that our adversaries understand that both in terms of U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency, you know, we have the capabilities upon which, uh, you know, if the president uh, so uh, decides and authorizes that we can use. So, so you wouldn't, this question of whether rules of the road would be too restrictive for the United States, um, do you, do you, is, is there a, a view you have on that that you're willing to share? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you, you've talked a number of times in our conversation about, about partners and right. partnerships. And you operate in a world where, you know, the most exclusive security partnership uh, ever, uh, known as Five Eyes, uh, is, is just, you know, the, 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 uh, the combination of the, the closest allies that we've had, uh, deep uh, levels of trust and sharing. And uh, as, you, as you talk about partners in this world of, of increasingly difficult threats, is it Sensible, do you think, to expand, not five eyes per se, but expand that extraordinary level of trust and cooperation to other trusted partners so that we have a somewhat broader and ro more robust ability to, to, to operate in the world? You know, I think that, uh, that partnerships, and uh, certainly the secretary and the chairman have talked about this, uh, partnerships are really the lifeblood that makes us so different than our adversaries. Uh, we have enjoyed a historic partnership with the Five Eyes, as, as, uh, as you've uh, noted there. But there are other partnerships that, that certainly that, uh, that we will continue to work between like-minded nations. I would anticipate that, you know, that uh, new challenges to, uh, to our nation are going to require us to, to look at uh, forming other partnerships. But I think, uh, you know, rightfully so, I, I think that, you know, the Five Eyes will continue, and I think that uh, and will continue very strongly. And I think that uh, we will build um, other partnerships based upon the you know the circumstances and the missions that we're going to have to look at as a nation. The Quad, which is the uh, 
informal uh, partnership, not, not a security alliance, but a partnership uh, between the U.S., Australia, Japan, and India uh, is big uh, effort by this administration. There's a new Trade and Technology Council with the European Union, and in each of those formats, there's been a, quite a lot of discussion of cybersecurity issues. And I'm wondering whether uh, you, either in your NSA role or in your Cyber Command role, have participated in those, and whether you'd envision uh, some somewhat more participation in those kinds of forums that are ab about joint security, uh, but outside the Five Eyes framework. You know, David, it's interesting because, you know, if you think about any type of partnership that, uh, that our nation is trying to, to engender, what's commonality that, that nations can seek? So one of the commonalities is certainly cybersecurity. So in general, I would say, you know, this is, this is one of those areas that I would anticipate that you know, our nation wants to, to pursue with, you know, other like-minded nations. Uh, I am intrigued by a number of the different work. I, you know, I've just seen the Chief of Naval Operations off the coast of India working with uh, the Indian Navy. Um, I, I think that, again, to the, the changing dynamics of our security environment, uh, you have to believe that, you know, there are going to be just unique partnerships that, that come from that. And I, again, I come back to is, you know, if you're looking for a commonality, most nations uh, say, I'd, I'd like to operate with you in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And you'd be open to that? within rules that are set by policy. Well, well, certainly. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, that one of the strengths of, of both the command and the agency is that, that we've been able to, to work with a number of different partners, and, and that is, you know, that's indicative of what we're going to do in the future as well. Let me ask one of the uh, hardest uh, questions, I'm, I'm sure, which is the security of your operations. Uh, NSA has faced some uh, insider threats from employees. Uh, the Edward Snowden case wasn't exclusively NSA, but it sure had an effect on you. Um, there have been other uh, cases since then of employees who um, took an awful lot of very classified material, it seems, uh, out, out of their uh, workspace. And, and there's been a, a, a continuing question among people who follow intelligence about whether there's a deeper counterintelligence problem for you uh, at the NSA and at Cyber Command, uh, that, that there's somebody inside who's been feeding information and is still not detected. So I, I know counterintelligence is a very sensitive issue, but I, I want to ask you, both on the insider threat level and, and the broader counterintelligence level, uh, whether you feel you've got a, a handle on the risks to NSA and Cyber Command. I have tremendous confidence in the folks that, that work at our command and our agency that, that look at counterintelligence. I would tell you that, um, you know, we have, not been, uh, we have not been still, we have not been static in terms of looking at what our vulnerabilities are, and I'm sure that's true of every director, that they think about this. Um, but, you know, I, I think in general, I, I would say that uh, we are in a much better spot today, uh, but it's not a spot that, you know, we ever, will ever rest on. So I want to ask you one last question, then we're going to turn to our uh, Aspen uh, uh, Young uh, Leaders Group for a couple of, uh, of questions. You have been uh, uh, at NSA, uh, I believe, for four tours. You've been um, uh, uh, our cyber commander uh, f for many years now, and you have a, a body of experience that's um, probably unmatched. And so I'm going to ask you if you would just share with this audience um, the things you'd like to do going forward, the things you, you talked about, a lot of the initiatives you made, the things that you've gotten done. What is still on your to-do list that you might be willing to share with us that you think would make these two agencies stronger? Uh, the, number one, the number one thing on my to-do list is talent. Um, you know, even after as many times as I've been at NSA and the experiences I've been at Cyber Command, it comes down to the equation of who has the best talent. I'm convinced of that. I, I, I mean, I've seen it. I, I've seen the, you know, the, the benefits, and, and we certainly have been beneficiary for, as of tomorrow, 69 years of great talent at our agency. Um, so I'm always thinking about that. What can we do more of? What can we do more to recruit? What can we do more to retain? What can we do more to have our folks rejoin our agency when they leave it? Um, 
you know, I think the, the world is changing and so we have to change just as rapidly to be able to be competitive and attractive and, and in this mix of talent. Uh, I think the second piece is, is um, you know, over the, the, coming, uh, the coming months, I think that, you know, clearly cybersecurity is, is going to be uh, central to the national security of our nation. And I think that that's an area across both the command and the agency I, I hope to leave my mark. Um, we were able to stand up a new directorate. We have outreaches to the private sector. Uh, we're working very, very effectively, I think, with our government partners. But there's more to do. Uh, there's more to do. And I think the last piece I would say in, in just moving forward is uh, really is just continuing to maintain that, that state of readiness that we've had for so many years at the agency and the command that, um, you know, our nation's going to face different challenges in the future. It's perhaps not the challenges that we think today. And so how are we agile enough to be able to get at those challenges? That's with a mindset and a culture and an ethos that, you know, I think, uh, I think that, that we've made tremendous progress at the agency and command on. So you refer to young talent, uh, and we have some uh, here in our uh, Aspen Security Forum uh, rising leaders. I see a hand up from a rising leader. Let, let me recognize you for a question. Hi, General Nakasone. Thanks for being here today. My name is Erica Lee. And my question for you is, do you believe that the NSA and Cybercom are adequately or appropriately resourced money, personnel, technology, and capability development for the speed, scale, and scope of not only great power competition, but to also combat malicious non-state cyber actors? So Eric, a really good question. And you can well imagine anyone that leads uh, two organizations that you know, they would never say they have enough resources. Uh, I would always like more resources. Um, but I would tell you that we are very well resourced across both the command and the agency. Um, part of what we have to do now is the resources that are given to us, how do we effectively apply them to the challenges that you just noted there? Um, this is, you know, not only resource, this is, you know, how is the mindset, you know, how is the, the culture upon which we're going to operate? Those are all things that, uh, that we're very, very focused on. So thanks a lot for the question. Do we have another question from one of our rising leaders? Thank you, General Nakasone, so much. Um, my name is Helen Toner. I work at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. My question is about China and some of the intrusions that they have managed to pull off over the past few years. On the one hand, people look at things like the OPM hack, Equifax, and so on, and they say, well, China looks like it's gathering lots of data on American citizens, American officials, and putting it all together in ways that it will be able to use. On the other hand, we know that data fusion is incredibly challenging. And you know, using you know, any data scientist knows that 95% of the work in solving any problem is cleaning and structuring the data. So I'd love to hear your take on the extent to which you think China does have some kind of underlying plan or underlying ability to, to combine what they're gaining from these different intrusions versus the extent to which you think they're fairly separate incidents. Thank you. Um, so Kelly, first of all, thanks for the question. I, I think you, you hit on the, the great geopolitical change of of what our generation and your generation is going to have to deal with, which is China. Uh, this is unlike anything I've ever seen before. This is not the Soviet Union upon which I grew up in. This is uh, a nation state that has a dis different risk calculus that's impacting us economically, diplomatically, militarily, and informationally. Uh, in terms of you know, their intent for the data that they, uh, that they continue to steal and utilize, uh, you know, I would say that we have to be you know, just vigilant in terms of uh, one, how do we get to a higher level of cybersecurity so we prevent this type of work? But two, uh, we should not underestimate, you know, the capabilities of our adversaries. And that's something that, you know, I've probably learned over three decades in service to the nation. So thank you very much and good luck. So we've come to the end of our allotted period. It's 10, 1030. I um, just want to thank, I'm sure on behalf of everybody, General Maxoni for coming here to be with us. It's great when uh, the representative of America's basically most secret uh, activities comes and, and talks to a group like this. Thanks a lot for doing this. Thanks, David. It's always good to see you. Will you come back? With pleasure. Thanks. With pleasure.